right, everybody. Um, despite um, Firestorm not sounding crispy like chips, we're, we're still here and the space is going to go on. So in the spaces we're covering um, mainly what's happening in the weekly news and what's happening in the gaming industry and Web3 as a whole. As you can tell, we've got some lovely, 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 jubbly people on the stage today. Uh, Peyton from Azra Games, I believe. Say hi from Neo Tokyo News. Shout out, represent Neo Tokyo News. We've got... Um, We've got the main man, uh, Firestorm from the Neo Tokyo page himself, Felix Norton from Spectre VC, and we've got the rebel, Dr. JPEG from Non-Fungible Arcade for the one or two people in here that don't know. So, um, in this space, it's pretty chilled out. You know, we're going to talk about Scam Bankman Freed, who's right now doing a bit of a PR run, like a YouTuber who's, who's released a book and he's going from podcast to podcast, trying to convince people to join a scam, uh, Kraken cut out 30% of their workforce, which reminds me of what's happening with Apple right now. Um, they're on their 30% journey. We're trying to get 30% of the gas fees off of the Coinbase NFT um, trading app. It, it's stupid. Um, a lot of good stuff that Elio posted with uh, Gigamart. I think we, we need to chat about that and just whatever's happening in gaming. So unless, Zeha, if you want to uh, mention anything that's happening in the news, we can start chatting about what's what's happening with games. I think I think let's take it back. I want to chat to JPEG. Um, JPEG, what's one of your earliest um, memories of games? And I know you've probably answered this question before, but I think it's a good way to kick us off. Um, you know, your first or formative gaming memories, where you started and what, what really got you going? Because I think gaming is why we're together here. Yeah, bro. Well, you know, I, I think um, my first first game I ever played was, you know, uh, Crawling Out of the Hole. And, you know, it was, it was, it was sick, bro. I got a high score. Um, no. Uh, yeah, man, uh, I, I think that everything that we're doing is related to arcade games and like just throwback, like nostalgic games. So uh, a, a game that really impacted me personally and like my childhood definitely is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time. Um, fuck, man, I love that game. It's 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 just a ton of fun and it just it, it has a, this just euphoric feeling anytime you boot it up for me personally. Um, so, I, I, you know, you're talking... You're talking early '90s, right? So, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a good time, man. That's that's. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a little behind. Uh, that's a little before my time. I grew up on PS One and playing Tekken and uh, a little bit of PS Two, Prince of Persia, a lot of FIFA Street. Um, I, I can see a lot of people relating to that. Um, I know recently I saw Firestorm with uh, a bunch of his cousins in a room, um, just uh, <laughs> caving away. What, what was that all about? I'm lucky enough to have 28 first cousins on one side of the family and about 20 of them all live in town with me. So a couple of times a year we get together and throw a nice Halo LAN party over the years. That's obviously looked different as we've gone through console generations. So now with the Master Chief Collection, which is cross console, you can connect the PC to a console. You can play any of the Halo games besides the latest Halo Infinite. It's, a, it's always a great time. Um, but we set up in a my uncle's office building cafeteria. <laughs> so that was that picture I posted the day before Thanksgiving the other week, which is a lot of fun. But I'm a big Halo guy. Definitely grew up on Halo, um, first person shooter genre, and that's been something that I've carried into it. So hosted many LAN parties over my life, and you know we we do a couple times a year just to gather around. It's always nice to play with each other in person as opposed to online, which everyone focuses on these days, but in-person gaming where you can trash talk and see each other, that sort of thing. It's just, it just hits different. Yeah, man. You say the nineties were before your time. I go back to the golden age, man, back to the eighties. That's when video games were, were really classic. They're just first starting out. You know, like, you know, we've been inspired uh, here. Becker was quite inspired by ready player one. Something I liked about that is like all the throwback and the, the retro 80s stuff. I still get some nostalgia with some of that. Um, <clears throat> really the first home games and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I grew up with, with a lot of that. My dad was like one of those, like kind of a dad from Gremlins, you know, who's always bringing home the stuff that uh, doesn't quite work out. Had, I had this one called the Vectrex. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. All my friends had the Atari. You know, it's like the fancy Atari home home video game. I had this one called the Vectrex. Oh, it's going to be way better. You get your own monitor. You don't have to use the TV. Thing was dead in about a year and a half. 
And so then I got like an Atari computer, Atari ST. That still had some killer games, like uh, all these Sierra adventure games back in the day. King's Quest Three, ranked number fifty in the top fifty video games by Time Magazine. Yep, and um, Leisure Suit Larry, those kind of games, you know. Of course, yeah, dude, went out of you're showing your like age a... here. These references yeah, are just going over my head. <laughs> yeah, I've got, got no clue what he's talking about. Oh, shit, man. These are, super these are all adventure games. It's really interesting because, I mean, that era, what we should be looking at were like Web3 games because the technology is kind of equivalent. And the ones, the games that were successful back in the 80s would probably be the kind of style that we should be shooting for some of these Web3 games. Wait, wait, did you just liken Web3 with 80s game technology? <laughs> yes, I did. Wow, wow, that's a very bold statement. <laughs> yeah, I'll be honest, some of these games sound way better than uh, some of the Web3 games that I've played, so wouldn't mind that. Fair enough. Well, fair you, enough. you could compare, like, um, what's it there, the World Wide Web one with, uh, with some of those old 80s adventure games. Very similar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Peyton, what about you? What, what's your your overall gaming experience and memories? Yeah, I was going to actually also ask Firestorm what, what Halo is your favorite. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll go with mine. Uh, remember, like, my first memory is uh, watching my sister play Ocarina of Time, um, Legend of Zelda. So uh, RPGs were always kind of a special place because of just a family connection there. So I used to watch my sister play um, that in Final Fantasy. And then when I got the controller, um, was like a, a WWE. And so we used to do that. And then um, whenever I first uh, really got like addicted to video games, like really badly, uh, it was Halo 2 uh, into Gears of War. Uh, Gears of War was like uh, my sister and my brother moved out of the house going to college. And I got to play uh, pretty much nonstop. Uh, Gears of War was that first one that I really went off the deep end. Didn't like really see my family just for meals. Um, and then uh, from there, Halo 3 to Modern Warfare uh, to... Just, yeah, I was a big uh, first-person shooter guy as well, Firestorm. Yeah, it sounds like we're in the same boat. We should squad up sometime. Halo 2 is my first love as well. And I remember visiting my brother in college. He was six years older than me. I was in, like, middle school. Um, their entire college campus network was wired over Ethernet. So you could plug your original Xbox into the wall. And so they had, like, thousands of or hundreds of Halo 2 LAN servers set up just through the wall on campus. And so... I visited him one weekend, played a bunch of Halo 2, and then really fell in love with it. But that was just an insane setup that would not happen today. Just that local area network setup over an entire college campus was amazing. That is crazy. Yeah, I feel like that's one of the things about gaming, the fact that uh, it's not just the actual game, it's the people that you play with. Um, and that you know brings in the aspect of community, because some of the games that I like is not only because the games were great. I mean... Yeah, everybody played Black Ops, but the reason why Black Ops was so good is because I played with my cousins every single day for, like, hours on end. Um, so, where do you guys think that community aspect of gaming is right now in Web3 and sort of, even in traditional gaming, I think community is what makes uh, a game, takes it to the next level, because you can either play it alone or you could play, play with a thousand people, watch YouTube videos, react, and, you know, be part of a bigger thing than just the actual game. Um, where do you think community lies with respect to Web3 gaming right now? I personally kind of like it, to be honest. Uh, it's a lot less quieter. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot quieter uh, from the bull market. Um, you know, the, the conversations that we have now, um, I think everybody is on like a common base that like Web3 gaming is a future with NFTs and all that stuff. Um, and so it's very easy to relate. I've been actually just making lists of people and contacts to follow during the bull market because as you all know, there's so much freaking noise. Um, you know, everyone just trying to get attention, but like these people are the real OGs. So when I look left and right, you know, playing Firestorm with like uh, specific like video games or like Call of Duty and all that stuff, talking about like, you know, the future. And so whenever we get there, He's like, dude, this guy really got it, right? Not this person that's like trying to come in and do that. Not saying that like we obviously want people to come in, but uh, there is something that is a bond during the bear market um, that I thoroughly actually enjoy. Um, but I know not everybody likes the bear market. I think there is a difference too where communities have kind of formed first in some ways in Web3. In the case of Neo Tokyo, like the community was formed 
around the hype and speculation of the S1 Mint, which had gamification, but so much has been built after that. And so it's kind of the opposite of some traditional Web2 games where the game is definitely first and then people fall in love with it and then form a community kind of out of necessity to, to sync up and to talk about it and to game with each other. But community first in Web3 is definitely a difference that I see and honestly makes it a lot more powerful because people form relationships first in some cases, and then they kind of fall in love with whatever that Web3 project or game is building. It's something that has made, made me fall in love with Web3 a little bit more as opposed to the communities in Web2, which are less focused on the relationships and more just on the actual game itself. Yeah, I think I think I, I I'm gonna I'm not gonna give a bit of pushback, but I'm I am gonna say that with that in mind, um, although the community is great, I think the one thing that JPEG pushes quite a lot is the fact that games actually need to be fun and people need to play games because I feel like people over focus on community in Web three and they don't actually focus on making their games fun and addictive and um, you know uh, JPEG, you got anything to say on that? Yeah, I think Firestorm really hit the nail on the head when he's talking about you know i think web3 focuses on like build a community build hype push nfts in uh this magic internet money and don't worry a game will come soon as opposed to you know with with traditional gaming right like you you see a game first and foundations are built around that and i think that we're starting to see it where you know, it's like, oh, well, we we're making game and it's fun. It's like, yeah, no fucking shit. It's a game. Like, <laughs> of course, it's like that's a that's a, that's a requirement. Yeah, if you, of course, it's going to be fun. If it's not fun, people aren't going to play. What are you talking about? So it's starting to get those standards uh, that are from a traditional gaming market and bringing it to Web3 and, and starting you're starting to see that that flip where people are choosing to lead with a product or at least a sample of a product and and build a community around it because that's great like you know neo tokyo is something that you know holds a special place in a lot of people's hearts mine included but certainly not limited to so community is, is super powerful but i definitely think leading with the product um is something that is it has to be a necessity right yeah, and I, and I think Felix could probably comment on um, the, this next idea because uh, I was attending one of the Twitter spaces for NFA and I think it was Jorge who mentioned that we often uh, look at Web3 games through, through the eyes of seasoned Web2 gamers. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of seed stages that we're going through with a lot of these games and we can't really you know, expect them to have uh, the same proficiency as Web2 games. Felix, I, I think with Spectre, um, have you seen, you know, those early um, hiccups with trying to get communities and games together and, and how that transition is going? Yeah, I mean, both yes and no. So so one thing that a lot of ambitious products out there trying to do is is tap into the whole drive of the community to help grow the economy and then potentially sell mints to fundraise or even go into allocations from these. But I think one key thing that we struck upon here is that it's very valuable if there is a game to play already that is a lot of fun, because that then can act as the perfect glue and actually proxy to build a stronger community, in my opinion. And that's been something that has been core to our investment thesis when it comes to to games overall, that if there is a game first and they, they build a strong economy around it, rather than building the economy and tokenomics at the same time as they're building the game or even before then, then the game would probably be a lot better over time as well. Um, so definitely, definitely. What are some games out there in development right now that you see, you guys see as uh, exciting and that could kind of break that reputation of Web3 games sucking? Ooh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, people probably already know my first go-to answer. Uh, so I... Yeah, yeah, always, <laughs> always. Right. Uh, I mean, I know Peyton had an a uh, had a space with with Francis over there uh, today, along with a few other parties as well, and it was a great uh, space to listen to. So if you haven't listened to that one, I would definitely go and check it out. Um, and then, I mean, I've grown to become friends with Francis, and we do a lot of stuff on 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 the side as well. And the team seems to be amazing; they're doing great stuff. Uh, and I'm convinced that that game will help mark out the the future of of gaming or at least set the 
the next bar when it comes to AAA titles. But apart from that, I mean, other parties that are, that are, we've been involved with that I know is doing something interesting, for example, Collider, with their tournament they're doing right now. Um, I know we'll, we'll be talking more with them when they have some more time, but um, that whole mosh pit game that they're building is also very, very interesting. It's fast-paced. It seems to be a lot of fun. Once they crack multiplayer, I think that is going to be immense, immense fun to actually participate in. But I know JPEG also has some some really good ideas, I think. Yeah, I mean, shout out to those boys. Uh, you know, the studio that put put out Clara Craftworks and put out the mosh pit. They know what they're doing. They've they've been around since 2014. They have like an 80 man team, and uh, they've worked on some of our favorite titles. So, the game is amazing. I really like the movement. Um, we have some players in on, on the top of the leaderboards for the playoffs, NFA, and it's just overall a really really great game. I think that you hit the head and uh, nail on the head with with shrapnel. Um, I mean, there's. There's there's a good amount of people that are that are showing like what they're building and we're not we're not there yet with a product that is is playable, but you know you take a look at the roster right these aren't these aren't these uh these degenerate kids that came over from from Web three that are trying to do something but these are seasoned veterans that that are you know these teams are comprised of and you know, they're really making waves and I I ran into Tony from Shrapnel down here and got to catch up with him and uh, I'm super bullish on them the the indie game devs on the call and probably won't like my answer here but i'm kind of a sucker for triple a tiles and not just the like quality of the game but like the actual ip so as i mentioned i'm a huge like halo fan but i was listening to uh lex friedman podcast he interviewed todd howard just the other day who helped create skyrim uh he's currently working at elder Scrolls 6 made fallout he's working on starfield that's sort of you know, those major titles from Bethesda. And I'm just excited for like one of the IP properties that I love to pick up some of this tech to, to unleash that upon the, the greater gaming world. Um, I'm not much of an indie gamer. So obviously a lot of the Web3 games that have come out over the last year have been more indie game studio focused and no knock on them. Like they have audiences for sure and they make quality stuff, but I'm just kind of a sucker for the IP that brings that nostalgia. And so that's something that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, that's a great point, you know, that for for games to really succeed in this uh, web three, it's hard to just all be indie. We got to need some big games, big names to step into the, uh, the sphere here. Just want to welcome a couple other people onto the stage here. We got uh, Ben Gothard, who's a regular with a lot of our uh, Neo Tokyo news spaces. Good to see you up and about. Yo, uh, yo, yo. Hey, hey. And then we got Johnny Hustlepedia celebrating your one year anniversary for crypto, working with Crypto Banter, I saw. Good to have yeah, you up there. Time, time flies. Thanks for having me up, guys. I was just thinking about that, too, because, you know, in terms of like getting adoption, there's two different. Uh, angles you just mentioned a third which i think is probably even the best uh, angle of getting major ip into it but then you see people like you know kind of what elio talks about a lot is just to make a game that's so good people don't even know and they don't even realize that it's like you know nfts are involved in web3 just kind of just make some fun that people want to play and they don't even realize it you know so the haters can just kind of fall into it um and then there's the idea of just making games that really make real good use of the technology and and add features through the use of nfts and and uh, blockchain technology that you just can't do with regular games i wonder like what you guys are thinking uh as a more effective angle on that uh i'll i'll, I'll go in but i just want to kind of say the shout out for like the games um i won't chill us uh but i'd say wildcard is very uh actually looking beautiful um just got off the team with them today uh we checked them out in cloud castles i'd say is like really going for like a veteran team in terms of like technology wise in terms of custodial wallets and and things like that i think is is really cool is what pirate nation is going to be doing on the polygon it's a completely uh on-chain network so uh on-chain game so it's very curious to see how that operates and you know if they pull it off as an on-chain game and custodial wallet setup and like streamline it uh i could see them really getting looked at in terms of acquisition for for other projects out there um and uh the other one kind of like i'm still kind of doing research on is like stella fantasy 
Um, that one's kind of like a, a Genshin type of uh, replica, but like looks good with gameplay um, and some cool stuff. So uh, I would say those have been ones that I've been kind of tracking um, to do some product research on. Um, and yeah, um, those are the ones that I, I would say I want to kind of give a shout out to as looking really good. Yeah, I like that you mentioned Polygon because I feel like um, Polygon has really been upping their game with partnerships. And I feel like in, in gaming, because there's so it's uh, much easier to scale on Polygon. Um, and I believe uh, Legions and Legends are also integrating with um, Magic Eden, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, we did, um, we, we did our uh, hopeful uh, drop, um, our, our mint uh, with Magic Eden, but we are on Ethereum um, and we're, we'll be choosing a layer two. Uh, in which to scale uh, Legions and Legends, uh, which is a collectible combat RPG. Uh, but yeah, that, that definitely is something that we are looking into, and definitely you can't make a game on uh, Ethereum uh, for the gas fees and everything like that. So we'll be choosing a layer two, uh, but just not just yet. Got you. Uh, I, I do want to circle back to what Zehai said um, about um, the, the idea of three tiers of, of how you can scale games. And I feel like, and I might be the devil's advocate here, but I feel like one of the easiest ways to get um, sort of Web3 gaming or play to earn gaming or crypto gaming to the mainstream is for a mainstream game to implement something of that sort. Because if we take what Reddit did with NFTs recently on Polygon, I feel like that made such a big ripple in the uh, non-crypto space that we almost need someone like, again, Fortnite or maybe FIFA with their packs or something of that sort to come in. Um, or do you guys want to get pushback on that and you think that the actual Web3 growth is going to come from within the industry rather than um, from Web2? And this is like mainstream. I'll, I'll take this one real quick. Ahead. Yeah, I'll just like kind of get my thoughts quickly because I actually think that no outside source would come into the industry unless there are successful case studies inside of Web3 gaming. Uh, and I do think, you know, we're only what? 18 months now last may we got you know axie infinity really started exploding we're 18 months where this industry of nft gaming and crypto gaming is like in the limelight that's not even the development timeline of one call of duty game right so you have to really like take a step back we're so early in this industry and i think those case studies will come whether it's like the shrapnels whether it's like alluvium uh stuff i'm bullish on as well and then like dead drop and kiraverse would be my shout outs as well uh I, everyone's kind of talked about projects that have a lot of mainstream potential but uh you know games that look really good that are going to integrate the technology in a smart way uh like i said with dead drop you know the, the nfts really aren't in your face you pay with fiat whenever you buy skins so it just makes a lot of sense and i think the case studies will come from web 3 or yeah from web 3 and that's when we're going to see the big studios and the big players coming in yeah i just want to echo that too and like really there's not really a lot of incentive um for big corporations to come in like microsoft activision or anything like that uh, in terms of like their balance sheet they're owning web 2 like even fortnite right why even jeopardize the the billion dollar machine that it is uh fortnite and skins and everything like that um when you know you have this war chest that you could possibly acquire um you know these quarterly statements too these guys are shareholders and so the gamer um specific crowd right now doesn't like it so they also have to explain to their shareholders like why they want to pit in that direction and they say downward decline of like Q2, Q3, you know, Q4, end of year reports, and uh, they are completely getting uh, slapped uh, through their uh, crypto strategy or NFT strategy, and you know they quit altogether. Uh, when probably the smarter move is just to wait, like Johnny said, uh, on the fact of like, hey, you know, Legions of Legends is popping off. What do they do? Let's replicate it, or let's even try to acquire it. Um, which Microsoft has a freaking ton of money, right? Uh, which they are in the process of buying Activision Blizzard. Hopefully it doesn't go through, but there, there is like that aspect too. Um, but like you said, like FIFA and like some of the stuff, like I would like to hear like your guys' thoughts on like the pushback that like Minecraft and like Rockstar uh, did for GTA as well. Um, they're saying like no NFTs, like hell no. Um, I don't know, another point of topic we don't have to go into. I like to hear other people's panel um, about that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that some of those decisions have, Actually, wanna... have probably been a bit from ignorance at some level where they see the, the sentiment which a lot of people have is that nfts are scams they're not adding anything they're just trying to take our money but i agree with johnny where he said web3 games are going to have to prove that this tech can improve the user experience can prove that it's going to be a seamless um, thing for users and once that's proved in the web3 world 
then those execs who are, or whoever made those decisions at those properties will see that it worked and that they can adopt it well. There's such a consistent flow of billions of dollars every year through the Web2 microtransactions. Like It's going to have to be a major thing that convinces any of them to switch over to, to new technology that they have now is, is still working well for them. Obviously, the, the gaming sector is something that we're all super laser focused on. Um, but I actually think it's going to connect back into more of like a, a general metaverse play in an interesting way. Like I always think about things like super heavy industry or construction or like flight simulators for the military and different things like that. And so I think really big businesses are going to be in, continue to invest super heavily into this kind of stuff. And then they're going to bring in different things like gamification into what they're doing that'll kind of connect back to what every to everything that we're talking about too and as they keep investing into the technology and ai and you know all this stuff is connected at some level it's probably just going to make things way cooler and so there's there'll probably be a really cool convergence of all these different technologies and so it may not necessarily be like we have just this one sick game that totally redefines how everything is done and how everybody thinks about everything but it might just be the gradual shift of this is just better technology that's applied over a tremendous number of verticals and it all just connects and people are like oh well of course we're going to do it that way because it's better technology yeah it's funny you mentioned that because that reminds me of a, a video i watched uh, in the bull run when there was a lot of noise i think it was a shopping simulator at walmart and the idea was that you're in this VR world and you have your cart that you're pushing in, inside a virtual store and any product you put inside your cart is automatically um, sort of ticked off from your credit card and it's then delivered to your house. So, you know, those sort of immersive experiences, uh, the digitization of uh, existing experiences, I guess, I guess perhaps you could take um, work from home to a different level. You could be at your office and do some sort of transactions i'm not sure but i mean that walmart um idea really stood up because that is a way where you can gamify something that is actually happening irl while implementing a, an internal economy into it right you feel like uh, there's any um financial kind of hindrances where these big companies would not want to go to a more kind of decentralized system or system where the, the actual players have more of a chance to uh, benefit financially from the game than the company itself. Is that a factor at all or not really? I think so. It's like the walled garden type of thing. And like, if you open up the like live ops to your competitors as well, like you talk about uh, marketplaces and, you know, the exchanges of goods and assets within like the NFT marketplace, you now kind of see what works and what doesn't. Um, all of these are behind like Walled Gardens, which is like Activision Blizzard, uh, Epic, all that stuff. Um, so once you actually open it up, it gives the playing ground for like new players, like indie developers, a really big edge because now you're doing live ops, not just on a singular scale for like your indie game, but like on a larger scale for like a decentralized ledger. I don't see like major corporations wanting to do that for the fact that if it's a centralized ledger, they get to control and they get to see that live ops. And they get to show like studio what happens. Um, but I do think that like there is a lot of benefit with a decentralized ledger for like indie indie game developers. Like you can give achievements for let's say something that you're playing in Halo uh, three, like you know those land parties and stuff that you're talking about. Firestorm, you play Halo two, Halo three, you get a kill streak or you kill this specific person, um, and Halo wants to reward you in Halo Infinite, uh, and now all those servers are taken down, but now they can reward you because it's on a decentralized ledger. Uh, like, hey, this person gets this skin because they were part of Halo 2 or Halo 3. Um, and that's like really awesome. Or even take that out, indie developer, really big fan of Halo, uh, like me and Firestorm make a game. And we're like, we really want to target like the Halo like players, right? Now it's on a, a decentralized ledger. We can see that, but then that means that like it's imposed to like buy vampire attacks of like trying to like acquire some of those users. Uh, which is like a battle of attention. So I can see that there there could be a hindrance, though, for that type of thing, for live ops especially. And I think as far as just like the, the business model, it's going to be adopted regardless because uh, microtransactions now are just one touch point. So 
the decentralized model, the NFT model, the Web3 model, regardless, is a better fit for these businesses. Now, will we ever see Activision or, or Epic Games go fully decentralized? It's probably hard to judge and probably hard to say that they ever would. Um, but I would 100% agree with Azra on the fact that like there's pros and cons to both. But there's one thing that's indisputable is that the Web3 technology, NFTs, it is beneficial for the players, for the monetization, for the getting back your you know your time, just owning your assets, everything involved in the game, actually owning your achievements, so to speak. But then for the you know the, for the developers, they get more touch points than just selling you one battle pass, selling you one skin, because then they just take fees off the top of every transaction. So decentralized or centralized, I think the technology is is un, undisputable for these companies. Now I hope that we do see some decentralization, but of course. We know how these big businesses work and it's probably going to be a centralized you know model but at the same time i i think that the tech is going to be integrated so zay hi your question is it a financial decision i mean i really think that's a the major part of it it's like they have these walled gardens that are closed off that are sent completely centralized they also have developers that aren't experienced in web3 at this point and blockchain tech so that's going to be a major cost to transition from their current systems over to a decentralized system or something based on blockchain whether it is fully decentralized or not but i i think weighing the cost of that transition versus the benefits that they'll get based on new monetization streams plus the benefits players will get that's the equation that they're hopefully weighing in their minds and if they're not doing that then they're just kind of out of the loop and still ignorant on the part. I actually have a question for Felix. Um, for like, how long does it like a take like for a dev that might not have like any uh, industry knowledge of like EVM or like Ethereum or anything like that uh, to actually get spun up on like I could say crypto um, and like EVM compatible or NFTs? Um, like also, I'm like kind of thinking about it from like an engineering perspective for like game devs. They they are pretty good devs uh, in terms of just the overall um, market, right? Financial systems and also game engineers and developers are in, in high demand. Uh, how long would it take somebody, like let's say working at Activision Blizzard as an engineer or software engineer um, to spin up all this stuff? That's that's a great question. Um, so, so I would say it depends sort of also like to what depth you want to go when it comes to, to gaining experience and, and standing out uh, amongst the crowd because spinning up and, and just getting to create a, a simple NFT contract today is as easy as downloading uh, a package called ERC 721A and then you just say, hey, this is the minting function and then you're set to go. Then you can reproduce and just change what what metadata you want to have on your your NFT, but it's going to be as efficient as the Azagi collection, which for those who don't know, kind of revolutionized the whole NFT uh, minting experience with low gas efficiency and all that stuff. Um, but if you want to dig in deeper, I wouldn't say it's still that hard if you have some form of prior development knowledge. So, so for example, those people who have been developing in Unity, like a lot of indie devs, um, Solidity is quite similar to, to C Sharp, so I wouldn't be afraid to pick it up. It's sort of something in between that and traditional C slash C++. So it also fits well with uh, Unreal Engine 5 devs or Unreal Engine devs in general. Um, and if you just have interest in it, you can probably pick something up and become quite efficient in it in a couple of months, three months. I learned Solidity after Neo Tokyo through doing contract audits for people. And I had a ton of fun doing so. And now I, I'm sitting here experimenting with new tech and just digging into new um, improvement proposals like Sobun tokens and stuff like that. And that's... Yeah, how, how long has it been? Like 10 months? So it's definitely something that is easy for people to get going with if they want to, and they don't have to dig into the details of, of where I'm at, I would say. Is it one of those things that's like easy to start, hard to master type of things? Oh, yeah, yeah. Much like everything else when it comes to coding. Right. It's, <laughs> it's quite simple to get going as soon as you get over the initial hurdle of understanding why isn't my code actually running. But once you, you're not afraid of error messages and stuff like that, you can just start debugging and, and explore things and then you will learn and learn and learn until you hit this like hockey stick effect and then it's easy to absorb everything sort of thing cool thanks felix i mean there are still companies that are making a transition to cloud server 
technology based, you know, to their on-prem servers. And so these minis, it just takes a lot to transition to any new tech platform. And so, yeah, that's just something that's going to take a while for the bigger game devs to make that transition. Um, so obviously the indie studios, the more agile teams will be able to do that quicker and kind of prove out, um, you know, the, the theses. And so that's something that we're going to see and that we are seeing right now. The smaller studios are doing it. And then eventually the bigger studios will kind of adopt that and slowly transition and take advantage of the work that the smaller studios are proving out, honestly. I was actually going to ask a follow-up question to Felix from what you said, Firestorm, was like the, is it like also a mentality shift? Like, is it, is it a different like type of way of thinking when coding and developing on blockchain than it is on like normal, like web two stuff? Like, like, cause that's a huge transition too. That actually is probably longer than the transition from like downloading and understanding uh, like solidity contracts. That's also a good question. Um, for bigger companies, like what Firestorm we're talking about, definitely because you have so much legacy code and, and potential technical debt that you need to manage to move things around. Um, but when it comes to, to understanding the different mindsets, not necessarily. I feel like one thing that, that the developers behind EVM and everything and everybody who, who has been developing the whole blockchain space has been very good at is the layers of abstraction uh, because you won't necessarily have to even know of all the the blockchain uh, underlying blockchain tech, except for maybe knowing how to read what what a person is sending when it comes to uh, Ethereum to Mint and stuff like that. You you essentially need to know of um, the message object. You need to know about the transaction object, and then everything else is almost, I would say, identical to any other type of programming language out there. So it's it's not that much of a difference unless you need to dig into the, the whole deeper rabbit hole and make sure that everything is 100% secure and you need to make sure that nobody will be able to hack you and stuff like that. Getting deep into the dev Always. stuff here. Yeah, man. Always. Thanks for that. We should, we should, um, have our own, we should get our, have our own show for that deep into the dev. <laughs> deep into the dev work. Devs are doing stuff. Um. Yeah, let's, it looks like we're describing a world in the future where it's almost like the DeFi situation where you have these centralized exchanges, which could be like these big named games coming in and keeping this like, uh, you know, Web3 gaming in a more centralized way. And then you got more of the indie projects that are doing like the DeFi version of things. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, everybody's talking, at least in our circle, that this gaming is going to be the access really blowing open the market and making crypto uh, mainstream. So um, let's see. I mean, I think we should uh, transition a bit into doing some uh, overview of what is happening in the news. I see some uh, some ideas for that. I thought it'd be cool maybe if we just had Johnny do a quick like uh, market update. I know that's what you do on your show. If you want to give us anything exclusive, how you think the the market's looking these days and where we're headed? Yeah, uh, more than happy to talk about it. Obviously, this goes without saying, and I hate that I ever have to say this, but this is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just telling you exactly what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing in the market. So. Right now, honestly, it's unfortunate with this FTX dilemma, man. We had such a good uh, outlook with the S&P recently. I mean, S&P is actually doing okay, right? And if you look at the trajectory over the last couple of weeks, the S&P has actually gone up. And meanwhile, we had a epidemic in, inside of the uh, crypto industry with FTX, and it really dragged us down. If we continue to see the FT uh, or the S and P rally, not the FTX rally, we don't want an FTX rally. Jesus Christ! Uh, if we continue to see the S and P rally the rest of uh, the year, we could potentially see some sort of bounce back in crypto because. Yeah, we took a 25% dip in Bitcoin over basically a 10-day period just based off this news. And it's not a Bitcoin. It's not a crypto issue. It's a corruption issue. It's a person issue. So more so, I could actually see us getting a little bit of a quote-unquote relief rally before the end of the year just based off that. Now, unless the S&P does turn around, like 
the traditional market's going to have a lot to do with it. It's unfortunate. We might be at a 25K plus Bitcoin right now if we had seen the trajectory of the S&P alongside crypto and not had the FTX saga. Um, but I would just, you know, continue to do your research and look into the top projects. And I know we talked about Polygon earlier, all the real world integrations. That's not going anywhere for years to come. Like you can have the conviction in projects like that all day. Um, I think short term, we could see some sort of relief off of this contagion that we just saw inside the space. But overall, I think it's I don't think that everything's priced in as far as recession goes. I think the real estate market is going to take a hit. I think the debt crisis in America will eventually kind of pop. And long term, we probably do see a little more pain. But in the short term, I really do have the conviction that there's going to be some relief as long as the S&P holds. Right, and there's no other big black swan events. You yeah, know, of we course. We see a Kraken cutting a big part of their workforce. You know, if any more of these exchanges keep coming down, that's obviously not going to be too helpful. Um, what else we got in the news? Firestorm, you were mentioning this uh, Zuckerberg is back in the news here. What's his latest uh, <laughs> fake yeah. news? There is a story going around that he is stepping down from Meta next year. I think the board totally disproved that squashed that rumor but it just got me thinking like unfortunately whether we like it or not the the meta rebrand has kind of tied that company to our space in some way you know the metaverse angle at least and so the the major impact that this zuckerberg has on the space um i think when he the rumor went around that he was stepping down their stock price went up one percent because people thought that him stepping down meant that they were lowering their metaverse strategy and allocation um so i'm curious to hear the panel's thoughts on just like how how meta fits in with our space what kind of impact it will have in the near you know medium term future and if you care that zuckerberg is leading it or you know just the overall impact that they have yeah, I'll jump in quick. I think the way that Meta came into the space was a little unwarranted because usually when you make this much of a noise in an industry, you usually, often you have something to show for it. And I feel like Meta didn't really have something to show for it apart from you know some 3D renders of Zuckerberg having digital chats with his friends in a workforce, which I think is, you know, it's, uh, it's a bad representation of Web3. And um, the way that Meta came in, it was because there's such a big voice in the world of tech, I feel like they automatically became sort of the face or the spokesperson for Web3 or the metaverse as a whole. And um, to me, it seemed like they took a lot of the credit for what's actually already been built in the space and, and championed it as if it was their own. So I feel like until they build something substantial that is, you know, uh, either being tested by users or or something that we can see um, of of how it's going, rather than just you know promo videos, I don't really weigh what Meta's doing personally. I don't really weigh what they're doing uh, with with uh, too much too much attention because I don't I don't see a product there. I just see uh, well, they've changed the name, they've put out a, a roadmap, but now I want to see something tangible. I don't know. Maybe you guys disagree. I actually do slightly disagree. I think they're they. I think what they were doing had a lot of layers to it. Like if we jump back into the mindset of October or late September or late October, whenever it was, twenty twenty one, they were under a lot of fire from an information uh, leakage perspective. Like they weren't respecting privacy. There were potential talks of criminal charges. Blah 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 blah. So what they did was they brilliantly threw the scent off of Zuck and Sheryl Sandberg getting their asses sued and pro- you know possibly uh, suffering pretty heavily from that. Um, either the backlash of the of the um, just the backlash of the suit, or actually you know having them uh, go through with it and, and getting actual penalties. Um, so they when they did that, it totally changed. It was a brilliant PR move probably will go down as one of the best PR moves of all time. But also, they have Oculus. They have a tremendous, tremendous hardware platform advantage on a lot of anybody else. I mean, yeah, there are tons of really cool projects in Web3, but how many of us are actually building hardware to let people enter a virtual space? 
Uh, very few of us. I certainly am not. I wouldn't even know how the fuck to begin doing that. And they're investing billions of dollars into something like that. So I think what they're doing is actually really good for us. It's paving the way to show us a lot of what not to do. And they're also going to do a lot of the heavy lifting on the hardware thing. So I think they're what they're doing is actually going to end up being a net benefit for crypto and Web3 and blockchain. Um, and it, But just maybe in a little bit different way than we may have originally suspected. Hey, Fav, I saw you raise your hand down there. Did you have a comment on this? Yeah, I Everybody in Neo Tokyo hates on VR. I don't know what that's about. What do you guys hate on VR for? But uh, you called it right. The Oculus is like a game changer. It's like what the Famicom or the N- Nintendo system was. It's a, uh, it's an amazing product. Uh, the apps are getting better and better. I mean, there's a lot of room for improvement, obviously, but you can see where it's going. I just wanted to mention that, you know, that's such a huge sh- game changer. Yeah, that's a very good point. I actually always keep forgetting that they own that, so uh, definitely makes a big difference. Not so much to add there, but AR is also a huge thing too. You know, both AR and VR. We've had some uh, gotten involved in some good projects uh, with both, and I think that's going to be pretty huge. You know, it's going to open the doors for um, a lot of people and artists to start uh, creating new world for us to explore and uh you know interact in definitely pretty exciting what is to come and once that gets more interactive and people you know start really participating in it i think that could be one of the watershed kind of moments for the technology yeah for sure but i feel like one of the key things that may be stopping us from getting there is um censorship implied by these the big corporations because i actually want to get you guys your guys's opinion on this um i was thinking during the spaces right now it's hard for young games to scale i think especially mobile games because i i quite like mobile games quite a lot lately and i've been focusing on how mobile games can because they have such a big viral virality aspect to them i think web3 mobile games can scale, scale very quickly but with something like a 30% tax on every single transaction made via the Apple App Store or in-game uh, stores, how do you think games can position their um, in-game economy or their economics to you know, succeed? Because the 30% tax on every single thing that you own is pretty, pretty large, isn't it? Right. I, I think when it comes to like uh, mobile, though, they're kind of used to it, at least um, from uh, our studio standpoint. The aspect of like, you know, Apple taking a 30% cut is just like kind of just normal at this point. Um, uh, the one thing is that the terms and conditions, though, is kind of crazy uh, when it comes to the like NFTs. Like they're not actually saying no, um, you can sell, but like you're not able to like buy or anything. But they haven't put a lot of clarity out. And this is where like we're really wanting to get um, knowledge from Apple is where are you taking a 30% cut between like peer-to-peer transactions, right? So uh, Firestorm, if Felix want to trade a, a sword, uh, like are you taking it at their level or are you taking it at the marketplace level? Um, and this is not where it's been outlined when it comes to Apple. And I would rather like it being done within like Apple's, like you take the 30, you take the 30% fee off of like the 10% marketplace that we incur on like the Felix and Firestorm transaction. But that hasn't been outlined yet from Apple. So there's a lot of things. I think you need that platform, though. The 2 million uh, monthly active users currently in Web3, not going to cut it versus the 3 billion, or really the 2 billion that all is on uh, mobile. So, and it's year-over-year growth is still like 7% with 53% um, of the revenue generated by gaming. It's, it's ridiculous, right? So I would say that you kind of have to bend the knee if you want to play in their yard and uh, do that type of mass adoption. Um, but they're not saying no, which I'm happy about that. Yeah, I guess you kind of, I mean, you, you kind of have to bow down. But um, if, you, if you sort of compare that to the battle that's been going on with Twitter being on the App Store and potentially being removed, how far do we go? Because, I mean, Web3 as a whole exists on Twitter. And if Apple is threatening to remove uh, you know, Twitter off the App Store, how does that shape our industry in the future? Because that's our main uh, key focus for community and <clears throat> communication. Z, are you just... Yeah. Uh... No, no, sorry. Um, my, my son was about to come into the room. But like, yeah, uh, I, would, 
I would agree with you. You know, that's uh, definitely something that we worry about. You know, um, l- looks like Elon and Tim Cook uh, ironed it out. Uh, but I would say that's just kind of like the nature of a lot of things right now. That's the the, the culture that we're in is taking things down. Um, and that's never a good sign, especially when Web3 wants to be more open. Um, so yeah, it's just always adapting um, and, and seeing where the migration of like Twitter goes to, you know, even if it's Elon spinning up uh, factories and Tesla phones, uh, we'll probably be following that. We're heading towards wrapping up our first space here, reflecting on some things, uh, you know, as we're listening to this and discussing how Web3 games are going to really bring in mass adoption. Um, We definitely hear, even through this conversation, just some of the impediments that are out there that need to be overcome. You know, and we're all just small individuals here, and we can't do so much on our own. But um, I'm seeing that a lot of it comes from this, like, uh, um, almost this, like, animosity. You know, you see this animosity from traditional gamers to NFTs and Web3. And then in the Web3 community, you see this animosity to these big companies coming in to the to the space often. You know, people hating on meta and this and that, which, you know, there's good reasons for it all. Um, but I definitely think that that is going to be a, a key factor of just being welcoming um, and having good vibes and uh, doing our best to close these gaps and not buy into this kind of us versus them reality uh, or idea or concept. So just wanted to put that out there before we wrap up and then uh, pass it around if anybody else has any closing thoughts. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's like we all love gaming because it's fun, but we also emotional and there is animosity that comes up because we love it, you know? a balance in every gaming community of the hate and the love and trying to steer towards the, the love side because it's easy to get angry about something that you love. I think as long as we prioritize gamers and game developers and, you know, keep everything that gaming is at the heart of it and just, you know, use the technology under the hood to complement this ecosystem to empower people, we'll be good. Dave That's what it's all about. I've been, seeing, been seeing some new gameplay on the NF Arcade Twitter. Is there anything that you want to shout out? Yeah, man, we're we have Rebel Run live for our Rebel Heroes in the NFA Discord right now. So if you're a Rebel Hero, and you haven't headed uh, headed over to announcements. You can check that out. Put out a video. You guys can watch that, and then once you're done, shoot me a DM. I'll get you code, um, so you guys can play the game. It's a lot of fun. We're gonna be doing some things with it, but for now, just having fun. Sweet, Peyton. Anything at Azra you want to shout out? I just want to shout out the Neo Tokyo community. <laughs> Uh, you guys are awesome. Uh, it was like a very um, in-depth discussion and didn't know this was the route it was going to take and I really enjoy it. So thank you. Sorry for taking so much time. Just intellectually curious about a lot of this stuff. Um, and so, yeah, for us, you know, you, you can follow our Twitter uh, for Azra and then Legions and Legends. We're actually doing a, a drip campaign for our new characters that we're revealing for Legions and Legends. Um, and we're super excited about it. Uh, we're currently doing vertical slice right now and, and uh, gameplay is looking good. So uh, making sure that everything's polished and stuff uh, moving into next year. And so, yeah, if people want to figure out more about it, DM me um, here at the Azra Games uh, Twitter account or, you know, just follow our Twitter accounts and you, you'll get updates from there. Thank you. Awesome. And we appreciated all your questions. So thanks for coming today. Um, Johnny, anything from you? Uh, no, keep an eye out to, to close the year. Some more um, partners coming up for TTOO. Um, over 30 partners so far. And the goal is to just lower that barrier to GameFi. I know we all hate spending thousands of dollars to get inside of a gaming ecosystem. So just trying to give people many access points to all the top projects in the space. So look out for some big news to close the year. And and yeah, that's about it. Thanks for having me up, guys. I really enjoyed it. Love talking and I obviously love Neo Tokyo. Awesome. Yeah, on the Neo Tokyo side, everybody might have seen some teasers this week for Codebreaker. Um, Saturday, Codebreaker, big riddle competition kicks off on the Neo Tokyo side. So we've got opportunities for citizens and meat bags alike. So everyone's welcome to, to tune in there. Um, we'll have Codebreaker threads in the citizen and 
public parts of the Neo Tokyo Discord. So make sure to hop in there to brainstorm with everyone because it's not going to be easy. But I'm ex really excited to kick that off in just two days. Looking good. Thanks for everybody for jumping up and uh, having this uh, stimulating conversation. We're looking forward to uh, doing this regularly. Just about this time every week, Thursdays, is our intention. So join Next us. Next time I'll have the soundboard functioning so we can play the theme song. So you guys can look yeah. forward to that. Hopefully I have mine by then as well so we can have a mix for battle. <laughs> yeah. You need to help me troubleshoot right after this, Felix. I'm, I'm, I'm booting up the <laughs> test space for that. Okay, okay. Yeah, sure thing. I'll be available. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks. Later. Take care, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye.